I've been I've heard about this group from Adam for a few years now, and I've been excited to meet you guys. So this is uh, this is exciting. Um, so I'm probably going to say some controversial things today. Um, that's been known to happen time every now and then. Um, so please bear with me, okay? I'm I'm on the side of farmers. I am a farmer myself, all right. But we're gonna we're we're not gonna pull punches today, or tonight. Um, right. So uh, three years ago, I I quit my job with the USDA um, because I felt like the farmers were changing agriculture uh, and were leading ahead of the science. And working within that infrastructure, we just couldn't seem to, to adapt our science or, or the system itself fast enough to uh, accommodate these farmers who were really pushing things. And the only way I felt like I could really um, serve this movement that we're experiencing in this country and around the world is by getting out of the current matrix and rethinking not only how we approach apply, uh, like uh, uh, agriculture, but how we approach applied science. Um, and so that's really what we're trying to do with this Ecdysis Foundation, which is our 501c3, and then uh, the Blue Dasher Farm is our operating demonstration farm. Um, so, so there she is. It's a beautiful place, right? The United States is smack dab in the middle of it. Um, <laughs> So, but uh, although it's beautiful and a, and a wonderful place to live, we're, we're facing some serious issues right now, aren't we? Climates are shifting. Climates are changing. This is not a conspiracy theory. Extremes are the new normal, aren't they? Uh, and I drove through an awful lot of flooding that, uh, that I don't think has been seen in Nebraska and, and South Dakota before. Uh, human health problems. Um, Nieces and nephews in my immediate family, uh, four out of the nine grandchildren have severe autism. Um, we have uh, food intolerances. We have, uh, um, yeah, uh, things we haven't seen before. Pollution is rampant, civil unrest, um, declines in biodiversity. So we hear these, this list, and you could probably add to th and, and dispute what's on this list if you really wanted to. But at the end of the day, um, the point of this is, yes, we understand that there's issues that we're facing. What's so seldom done, though, is the, that um, almost all of these issues are connected to how we're producing food. Not that we are producing food, but how we're producing that food, OK? <clears throat> So biodiversity is near and dear to my heart. I was trained as an entomologist um, by Dave, amongst others. Uh, here, Dave Volan. Um, but biodiversity in general is in decline on planet Earth. This is the worst mass extinction event that we've ever experienced on, on our planet. It's called the Holocene extinction event. It's worse than the dinosaurs. Um, we're losing entire habitats. Um, wetlands were draining in order to farm fence post to fence post. Where'd the prairie go? Right? Most of Illinois was prairie at one time. Um, entire insect communities, it's called, being called the insect apocalypse. Um, it was in the New York Times of all places. Um, one study that just recently came out in Germany suggests that over the last uh, 27 years we've lost about 60% of insect biomass. Um, and we're documenting some of those changes in South Dakota um, communities as well. Butterflies, bats, birds, bees, right? The pollinator crisis. This is not a bee issue. This is a biodiversity issue, all right? But if we want to cart the bees out as the poster child of the biodiversity crisis, so be it. Why? How is this happening? What's causing these issues? There it is. It's not soybeans. It's how we're producing our soybeans, right? Huge monocultures. Agriculture has become far, far too simplified. Too simplified. What do I mean by that? <clears throat> 
Um, this is percent of total land area in the lower 48 states. This is not percent of agriculture, this is percent of land. 5% is currently um, uh, devoted to corn. Soybeans, 4.5%. Wheat, 2.5%. Alfalfa, 3%. On 15% of, of the terrestrial land surface of our country, we have four plant species that are growing, where once there were hundreds. And almost all of this is maintained with chemical fertilizers. A, a darn good chunk of it is, a, is treated with glyphosate annually. A good chunk of this is genetically modified. A good chunk of this is, is um, treated with neonicotinoid seed treatments, completely unnecessarily. That's simplified, isn't it? What's that look like from outer space? Uh, green is uh, soybeans, yellow is corn. The decisions that you make on your farms transcend the borders of your farms, all right? You are part of an aggregated community, and your decisions have profound effects. You know what? Um, I was talking with a, a university president after giving my talk, and he was upset with me. And he, and he said, you know, you're questioning scientific research, you're, you're, um, the way that it's being done right now, you're discrediting what we're trying to do. And we devote money for conservation agriculture, right? And I said, uh, <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a drop in the bucket compared to the resources that are... This happened on the land grants watch. And when, a, a, and when a university can drive through this and say, what has happened here is morally and ethically wrong, and we're going to devote the remaining resources that we have to fixing it, that is when the land grant mission of the university will be realized again. Right? <laughs> the only way to maintain a monoculture is with agrochemicals. Um, you replace, uh, you eliminate the biodiversity from that system, and you replace it with a jug, right? With technology. The more you use, the more you need. By their very definition, agrochemicals are an addiction, okay? Who wins in an addiction scenario? <laughs> it's not the addict, is it? <laughs> Who's winning in agriculture right now? There's a lot of money being made in ag right now. It ain't the farmers necessarily. Here's one that I like, don't like, but like to talk about. Um, neonics. These are uh, systemic seed tr uh, insecticides that are treated on the seed. Um, most of our field crops are currently treated with these things. Uh, about 13% of the terrestrial land surface of our country is devoted or is, is treated with neonicotinoids. On one corn seed, there's enough insecticide to kill 160,000 bees. On one corn seed, these are five to 10,000 times more toxic to honeybees than DDT was. So we can, we can, so they're marketed as this tool that's meant to, because they're taken up by the seedling plant, the young plant, it's supposed to restrict um, exposure to non-target species, to species that they weren't supposed to be hurting, right? And only thing that is exposed to these uh, is are herbivores, like the pests, the bad guys. But the reality is that they're not staying put. Um, uh, only 2 to 20 percent of the toxin is taken up by the developing plant, which begs the question of where the other 80 to 98 percent of the chemical is going. And it's getting into the water. And it's getting into plants that were never treated. And it's getting into the soil and staying there for a long time. Um, yeah, I just said all of that stuff. That, that number's wrong. It's actually 160,000. Still a lot. <laughs> um, 
We did a, we did a, uh, a risk assessment on, on monarchs. Monarchs are currently um, experiencing major population declines. They're currently at about 10% of their historic populations. Um, and one of the one of the culprits for this is is maybe the maybe the over reliance on glyphosate and over application of glyphosate Roundup, um, which kills a lot of milkweed. Um, monarchs are obligate feeders on milkweed; they need milkweed to survive. Um, so uh, the the use of herbicides like like glyphosate has has reduced the amount of, of milkweed in the environment. But that didn't make sense to me. I thought that it, because there's still an awful lot of milkweed out there. And I thought to myself, there's something else going on. And so we, went, uh, we started to look at these neonics. And we said, you know, are the neonics toxic to monarchs? And so we just gave them a little, the larvae, the caterpillars of the monarchs, which are these pretty little guys. This is work done by Jacob Pachenko, who's getting his doctorate now at uh, Purdue. Um, we just gave them a, a single pulse of an exposure to clothianidin, which is one of these neonics, okay, these seed treatments. And we just exposed them for 36 hours thinking maybe some corn or like dust from planting might fall on the milkweed and it'd just be like this flash. What would happen? And about 15 parts per billion was enough to kill 50% of the monarch uh, caterpillars. But what we would see is at one part per billion, and that's the way that these neonics work. They're, they're very toxic, but at very low doses, they have, they have sublethal effects. So we saw growth reductions, we see reproductive problems, we see behavioral abnormalities in the monarchs. And so that's where, this is the insidious part that has allowed these things to avoid a lot of risk assessment, or risk, um, regulations. Okay, so one part per billion. Then we went out into the milkweed, the remaining milkweed, and we found that 50% of them had, was, were hot for clothianidin. And what was really surprising is that within, within treated crop plants, the amount of neonic tends to go down as the season goes, goes on. But with the, with, with the milkweed, and now with other plants that we've been testing, it actually seems like it increases as the season goes on. So these non-target plants that are oftentimes used in conservation um, uh, are taking up these systemic pesticides, all right? Um, and they were at levels that were uh, four times uh, what we were seeing fitness effects. Yeah, do you have a question? Any theories as to why that's going on during that time in particular? I think it's leaving the crop plant and it's just taken a little bit of time for it to get into these marginal habitats that are surrounding ag fields. So one would assume it's probably other Yeah, I think I'll actually talk about that. So Let me see. this is not milkweed in a field. This is milkweed in like a pollinator habitat? Yeah. <clears throat> yep. So this is milkweed uh, in field margins that's not hurting anything, right? Okay. Here's some of my girls. Um, the neonics aren't staying put, and that's 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 one of the points of that of that um, uh, very short little uh, study that we did. Um, we decided, okay, the bees are dying. We are losing 150 percent of the nation's beehives every year. 150 percent of the nation's beehives. We requeen everything, which is a brand new hive genetically and then we lose more than half of those hives every year. This is the pollinator crisis, okay? No bees, no plants, no plants, no people. That's the simplest of equations, all right? Um, the neonics aren't staying put. We wanted to help the neonic. It does get happier by the end, folks, okay? So, yes, <laughs> it does get happier. Um, we wanted to try to feed the bees. Maybe if we could reduce their nutritional stress, then they could experience other stressors like a neonic exposure then, and not necessarily be harmed quite so badly. So what we did is exactly what you were saying. We planted, and this was work done by a former postdoc, Chrissy Mogren. Um, we planted these conservation strips, and we did this on seed-treated fields. And then we, we did this on organic fields that had never seen, um, that had never seen any treatment. 
And we get a lot of questions about, okay, what's the perfect blend for my conservation mix? And the simplest answer is that there is no such thing. You want diversity. You want lots of different flower species. You want big ones, little ones, blue ones, white ones, you know, different colors, different floral architectures, different heights. You want them to flower at different times of the season. Diversity, 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 all right? And so uh, this was our mix. You see that there's different flowering periods. There's a lot of different flower uh, types in there. Is it perfect? No, but it worked. And then what we did is we collected honeybees and we collected nectar and pollen and honey from each of these sites and then we quantified the amount of the seed treatment that we found in these untreated conservation <coughs> mix plants. Okay, so this is in the leaf tissue. And these are the different species of plants that had never been treated before and they were all hot for clothianidin. Uh, just to give you a little bit of a frame of reference, um, so four parts per billion is what uh, kills 50% of the bee uh, population, uh, honeybee hive, and then one part per billion is again where we start to see things like learning disabilities in the bees, and we see that they can't find their nest anymore, and they can't figure out how to overwinter, they can't figure out how to thermoregulate and you start to see reproductive declines because their sperm viability is lowered and, they're, and, they, and the queens can't figure out how to lay eggs anymore. And these are the sorts of things that you see way down here. Okay. Um, so we wanted to collect nectar from these flowers. If you've ever sat in the Illinois or South Dakota wind with a fine glass tube trying to stick it into a flower to capillary out, um, nectar, it, it sucks. <laughs> it's, it's very, very difficult. Uh, but the bees are really good at it, all right? And so we allowed the bees to forage on flowers and then we, we collected them up and then we ripped out their honey stomachs and we analyzed the nectar that they just drank. And what we found is that uh, the three species that we had meaningful sample sizes for were all hot at a low level for clothianidin. So it's getting into the nectar. This is honey and this is pollen. Pollen had 10 times the LD50. But what was most alarming about this study is that the organic farms and conventional farms had the same amount of contamination. The neonics aren't staying put. Organic doesn't mean organic anymore. So that's a problem. What is the solution? There's only one, and it's a hard one, fundamentally change agriculture. It's the only way that we're going to come out of this, all right? It's the only way the bees are gonna come out of this. And it starts in this room. Um, we need diversity. <clears throat> I'm gonna talk a little bit sciencey here and then we're gonna get more into application of diversity. Uh, we've done bio inventories. They're a royal pain in the neck to try to do. It's a lot of work. You've got to use. Uh, you've got to devote a lot of resources into into sampling um, all of the species in a particular habitat, or at least as many species as you can across a wide geographic region, using consistent methods, and then actually do something with the specimens. Um, but the value is 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 uh, is incredible the value of the information that we get from these things because the, suddenly we can understand how things are changing in reality. We can understand what the function of these different groups of insects are actually doing out there. So we've now done bio inventories in South Dakota corn. We found 480 species of insects in corn. Uh, wheat, we were just focused on predatory insects and we found 100 species. There's actually more um, Insect species, 172 species in cow crap. There was more in cow poop than there was in soybeans. That says something, doesn't it? 
Um, tons of species diversity. Why? And this isn't fairly heavily managed, heavily managed fields. All right. Why does that matter? Why do, why do we need that? Okay, good. The reason we need that is because communities are an entity into themselves. Okay. We're not dealing with individual organisms very often in reality. On your farms, right, we cannot silo individual species. Even the pests. Every species has a job. A community is like a puzzle. And if a piece it gets, gets pulled out of the puzzle, the picture doesn't look right. And so what we need is we need multiple species that can occupy similar niches. And so that redundancy becomes extremely important within the function of a community. So Ryan Schmidt, actually these are two scientists that we now have hired on uh, at Agadic Dysis. Ryan is in charge of research at, at, the, at the South Dakota location. Mike is just opening up our second location over in Minnesota now. Uh, but this was Ryan's master's work. He looked and we did bio inventories in cornfields and in pastures and prairies, perennial habitats that annual crop ground replaced. And we found that maize has about a quarter to a third of the species that these ancestral habitats had. Okay. So even though we were finding 482 insect species out there, it's a, it's a small fraction of what a healthy functioning community actually has. So that's really important. Very important. Because species are connected to each other. They don't live in isolation and, and, and we almost need to take a step back to really think about how to even conceptualize the complexity of these communities. To do that, we relied on what's called network analysis, social network theory. So we went, turned to the sociological sciences and we tried to explain what was going on from an applied angle with a complex community. Biological networks, um, uh, most of our understanding of these networks, food webs, right? Food chains, that's a network. Different species interacting, you draw links on the chain if somebody's eating somebody else, okay? Most of our understanding of these networks are actually done in very simplified systems, right? We have a black plastic pot and then we have, you know, we put our pest on there and then a little bit of this and a little bit of that and what happens? Which helps us to understand mechanisms of how communities interact and function, but it ignores that complexity of that natural system. This is an actual interaction network from a cornfield. All right. This was a royal pain in the ass to make. <laughs> 53 cornfields. We did complete bio inventories of the, all of the insects out there. And then we managed to look at statistical correlations among different species in their abundances. All right. So, this is a hairball, right? What am I trying to say with this thing? Let's, for the sake of argument, let's call 55 the pest. All right? This is the bad guy. This is the one we hate. This is what we're going to bend all of our efforts on, right? We're going to buy jugs. We're going to genetically modify plants. We're going to, we're going to control that son of a gun, right? With technology. But what we ignore when we focus, and this is true of so many things in biodiversity, right? We focus on the pests and ignore the lion's share of the species. When we do that, we forget that 55, you know, Mr. Pest, is actually connected to species that are connected to species. And what's driving the abundance of that pest is actually all of this stuff. This is where our management needs to be focused on. That's a fundamental change from how I was trained in entomology. Not by you, Dave. 
Each dot is a cornfield. Species diversity is over here, so that's how many species live in that cornfield. And this is the amount of pests. More pests, less pests. What is that saying? That's saying that cornfields that have high insect diversity don't have pests. All right? Where you have pests is where you eliminate insect diversity. This is community evenness. This is the relative abundances of all of these different groups, right? An even community has a lot of, uh, 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 it has a similar number of spe uh, 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 similar numbers of each species, right? And an uneven community has outbreak populations of certain species versus others. Even communities do not have pests. How do you eliminate insect diversity from a cornfield? Anybody know? Buy a jug. It doesn't matter what's on the side of the jug. It all does it. It all does that. How do you increase insect diversity in your cornfields or your, your agriculture in general? <laughs> Step one. Step one, yeah. How can you actually increase it from baseline? Anybody know? Yeah, plants. Yep. You need plants. The more plants, the better. Um, all right, so this is, uh, okay, so this is, I, I pulled out the main components from that hairball, right, to illustrate a point. This is a cornfield that has low pest abundance. Look at the connections, right? These species are knitted together into this complex community. This is a cornfield that has high pest abundance. Where's the connections? They're gone. There's even a pentagram. That's a sign of the devil. <laughs> I, I told that joke in San Francisco, and a lady came up to me afterwards, and she's like, um, I was offended by the pentagram joke. Uh, I'm a witch. And I'm like, ah. Oh. Geez, there's one in every crowd. Did that work for you at USDA? <laughs> um, so as, yes, and this teases out statistically. Uh, I wouldn't show it if it didn't. Uh, the, so the connectivity, as the connectivity in these cornfields goes up, you see the pest abundance goes down, right? OK, so that's the point. When you have a pest, That's your field telling you that you screwed up. All right? Solve the problem, not the symptoms. Stop reacting to symptoms. We don't have pests. We don't think about pests anymore. And we're not using pesticides. We're growing conventional crops, but we're doing it differently and we don't have pests anymore. And that wasn't supposed to happen, right? So it became clear that the, we needed to start using our science to understand what these farmers were finding. This was called regenerative agriculture, right? Um, what are, so regenerative agriculture is the future of farming, I truly believe. Um, a number of practices are, are go into or can be applied to attain certain goals. Certain principles unify regenerative systems. When these principles are in place, they work every single time. But you have to figure out the practices in order to make them work. You have to tweak these systems to adapt it to your own place. Regenerative ag is not technology intensive, it's knowledge intensive much different, okay? What are the principles? Number one, you need to stop tilling your soil. I think that tillage is more damaging to biodiversity on your farm than herbicides are. 
Never leave bare soil. There should always be living roots in the ground. Okay? Fallow is a myth. Some plant diversity is better than none, and more is better than less. And there's a lot of ways to get plants into your system that are agronomically sound. Okay? And then we have to be reunifying our farms. We need to stop siloing our, our different components of a, of a functional system. We need to get livestock and crops in the same place at the same time. When this, a system is developed, I mean, I've seen these things work from arid deserts to, to you know, the tropics, right? As long as these principles are adhered to and understood that this is the goal. This is Claire. She was a master's student. And what Claire did is, well, this is already published now. Um, what Claire did was kind of put the topper <coughs> on about 10 or 15 years worth of research that we were doing in cornfields, of which you've already seen some of that information. What she did is, is, is uh, attempt to validate what these farmers were doing. Okay, so uh, what we did is we went to the top regenerative farmers in North Dakota, South Dakota, Minnesota, and Nebraska. And we said, point us to your corn phase of your rotation. And they did, and we sampled the hell out of it. Okay. And then we said, point us to a neighbor who's farming corn really well, all right, conventionally. And they did, and we went and sampled that. So this was farmer-developed systems. This is not a research farm where, you know, some scientists come out there and they're like, okay, well, this is a best management practice, and this is a best management practice, and this is going to work, and this is how everybody should be doing it, right? This is the farmers over sometimes decades have developed functional systems tested them out, validated them, and now we have to learn from them, all right? Regional focus, and we focus on <coughs> systems, not, all right, I'm the entomologist, I'm going to just look at insects, and then we better get, you know, a weed guy over here, and the weed guy will work on weeds, and then we'll get a plant pathologist, and that guy will work over there. This was a systems level. We wanted to examine the functional unit was the system. Practices varied. Principles did not. But there were some universal practices that helped us to define these two systems. The regenerative cornfields did not use insecticides. All of the conventional fields had Bt corn and um, used neonicotinoid seed treatments. The insecticide treated cornfields had 10 times more pests than the ones that hadn't seen insecticides in a decade. That wasn't supposed to happen. That flies in the face of everything that I was, well, a lot of what I was taught, right? That we're supposed to, as entomologists, okay, this is, what, this is how you manage pests. You get down on your hands and knees and you watch your plants. And the pests are gonna be there, they're coming, they're unavoidable, and we should be terrified of them. And then you count them regularly. And then, and then they reach a certain threshold and then you react, right? You buy a jug and you spray it out there and you kill that pet. What these farmers said is no, pests are not inevitable if you design your system accordingly. Yields were significantly reduced, actually by 27%. Profits were twice as high. Why do we give a prize in every state to the top <laughs> yielding corn farmer? A well-trained monkey can grow 300 bushel corn <laughs> if they buy enough junk. Right? We should be giving prizes for profitability, shouldn't we? That's why we're in this. At least that's a part of it. That's how you stay in business. We looked at yields versus profitability in these corn farms. 
There was no correlation. You want to know what profit was related to? Soil organic matter. Why don't we give a prize for that? Why don't we give a prize to the farmer who grows the most soil this year? What a revolution that would be. Um, this study uh, for Claire's Masters um, in one day um, reached the 99th percentile of all science ever written in terms of social media impact. Not bad for a Masters program. Um, do you think that maybe there's something going on, like, the, like farmers are hungry for something else? I think that we're living proof of that. Okay, how am I doing on time? Are we okay? Can I talk about one more thing? Maybe like, give me five more minutes. Is that okay? You got it. All right. So, if this is all so great and farmers are changing the world, why isn't this mainstream? Why isn't everybody doing it? And there's a lot of reasons for that. I'm going to talk about one of them. Number one, of course, paradigm shifts are what we're talking about. Paradigm shifts do not come from the government. They don't come from the university systems either, okay? That doesn't mean that the government and university systems do not have a role to play in this, all right? Where paradigm shifts come from, where transformation comes from, is from the bottom up, from the ground up. It starts with you in here. The farmers are the ones who are going to make these changes. Um, and then I also think that science has been manipulated on this topic. We have a self-perpetuating problem um, with the way that science is being conducted in, a, in applied agriculture these days. It is bent on making a broken system work rather than thinking about how to transform that system from the bottom up. Rather than questioning whether or not we should have ever gone down this road to begin with. Um, and science manipulation is, even when you do want to make changes, um, science is manipulated to try to maintain the current system. Uh, this, this process has actually been formalized uh, by the tobacco industry, if you ever want to look into it. There's a really good um, Netflix documentary uh, called Merchants of Doubt, um, and then Naomi Oreskes, she's at Harvard, did a really nice book. It's thick, it's a little dense, but it, uh, I mean, the level of detail in just how science is formally manipulated by large corporations. Um, if you want to know more, that's how they do it. But in a nutshell, um, science is, there is not, there's never been a perfect study. Science has faults, right? There is no such thing, and we, we and so um, and so when you find that a, that a piece of science that you don't like or is hurting your agenda comes out, you simply have to pick it apart, and suddenly it looks like junk science, right? That there isn't value to that piece of work. Okay. So if science isn't necessarily black and white, science is gray. How do we make decisions based on science? You repeat studies, right? You rely on a preponderance of evidence. And eventually, you start to see the same results start to come to the top, right? That's the idea behind the scientific method, at least on one level. OK, so how do you get a preponderance of evidence? It costs money. Costs money. Who has the deepest pockets? Why is there naming rights on so many university buildings these days? <laughs> hmm? Why are so many just extension programs currently reliant on donations from large corporations? Right. You get the science you want. And th that doesn't mean that the researchers are doing bad work. It influences the questions that are asked. It influences the questions that are asked. And eventually, you start, to you start to see a preponderance of evidence that, you know what, that three bushel bump and yield that that product gives you is a pretty darn good thing, right? I had, uh, yeah. 
Um, okay, so you've got all right. So you've got a situation where you know you had a noisy scientist. Um, you discredited that piece of work and then funded a bunch of research that looks like it um, that that shows just the opposite trend and supports your product. All right, but you've still got this noisy person. They won't shut up. They've got data, right? So what do you do then? You destroy that person. You publicly eviscerate them. And not just them, everybody that they care about. They, they care about. You destroy their lab team. You destroy their families. And then you put their corpse on a pike and nobody else asks that question again. There is no incentive for a scientist to pursue a controversial issue. They get paid the same whether or not they count lady beetle spots or whether they do a risk assessment on monarchs and neonics. So why would they, why would they rock the boat? They've got people that depend on them, on that salary, on that program. Um, this is the question that everybody in this room needs to ask themselves. Okay? And not just once, but many times. Every day, in fact. Why are you doing what you're doing? Is it bushels per acre? Right? That's why I'm here. My God, I had 300 bushel corn last year. The neighbors at the, oh my, the coffee shop, they have shut their mouths. They, they are looking at what we're doing, and they're wanting to do the same thing. I win. Is it pounds of beef per acre? Is that why you're here? I hope it's not. In science, we are assessed on faulty metrics. How many pubs did you get last year? How many grant dollars did you get last year? How many students did you graduate last year? How many committees have you served on? That's how you get promoted. It's not how many lives have you touched, how many acres did you change. And I was damn good at working within that system. I had, I, I had, I had good stats, right? And then I asked the wrong questions and, and everything changed in my entire life and in my entire career. I went from being the golden boy to being the pariah. And, uh, and they started to suppress the science that we were doing that questioned some of the risk associated with these pesticides and genetically modified crops. Um, and that's not okay. That's never okay. And I had to ask myself, why am I here? Why do I do what I do? Is it for those pubs? No, it really wasn't. I made the choice of getting into science because this planet is facing some really serious problems right now. And maybe in one way I can help, right? But it takes bold action. It takes, you know how many pamphleteers are out there right now? Oh God, you know, do something about the bees. Here's your packet of wildflower seeds. If I see another damn packet of wildflower seeds, <laughs> they're ramming up somebody's butt. These, do something. Do so, change your own lives. That's where change starts, is with you. And so I quit. I quit pretty noisy. Um, we, we called it out, uh, suppression of science is never okay. And so uh, I quit and I started what became Blue Dasher Farm. Um, so, yeah, I don't... Oh, no, I don't have any Blue Dasher Farm slides, but we can talk more about that. If you'd like to know more, maybe I can talk about that at, at tomorrow or something at the university, too. At least give a few slides about it. Um, so, I would not be here if it was not for a tremendous number of, of just young, enthusiastic scientists that make getting out of bed every day uh, a hell of a lot of fun. Um, we are here because of donations. No strings attached research, right? At least as few strings as we can get. Um, we rely on donations and on education and things like that, meetings like this, to help us run the kind of science, ask the questions that other people are afraid to ask. Um, so, 
uh, if you like what you see, please support it. You aren't going to get this anywhere else, all right? <laughs> uh, Dices.bio, this is our nonprofit. You can give your money to the government or you can give it to us. This is bluedasher.farm. You can look us up on Facebook and Twitter. Um, and there's my email address. <coughs> and with that, hopefully we've got some things that people can think about a little bit. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Um, what's the the distance on the the traveling of neonics? I know that they can travel through a lot of different methods, and there's been some publications that show that even like in nature preserves, there's native plants that are contaminated. Yeah, we're. So, so we're doing some of that work with Fish and Wildlife Service right now where we're looking at um, uh, waterfowl production areas that are basically natural areas and testing a lot of the native vegetation to see whether or not um, neonics are getting into there. And yeah, uh, they're hot. So uh, what is the distance? Far. Do we think that's coming from plant material after harvest or? I think it's getting into the water. water. I think it's water, I think it's soil. We're going to do some work on volatilization. Mm -hmm. It's very possible that this is getting into water vapor from the leaves and then maybe raining down elsewhere. Be easy to test, so that's one of the first projects that we have for the summer that we're going to be looking at. So I think it's worth looking at. So it is pretty water soluble. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, yes. Yeah. Is it in the groundwater? Groundwater, I don't know. Surface waters, yes. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah. Do neonics metabolize at all? What's their half life? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, we. So it depends on many factors. Uh, yes, they do metabolize. They do break down. Um, thiamethoxam breaks down into clothianidin, which is their. So <laughs> it's like, uh, and we don't know the relative toxicity of the metabolites either. So that's another thing to be thinking about. The half-life is, is estimated to be up to three years, um, but that depends on a lot of factors. Um, so, you know, whether it's, it's bound up in the soil, whether it's, whether it's you know, uh, there's UV, wh what microbial community might be helping to contribute to the breakdown process. So it's complicated, and I don't think we have a firm answer for you. Yeah, okay. Sorry, yeah. Do we have a lot of um, many other studies on their impacts to other invertebrates? Um, we just published one. It came out a couple of a couple of weeks ago, but it was just featured in Scientific American yesterday, um, where we showed that uh, it's having uh, increasing birth mortality as well as um, uh, genital abnormalities and and uh, hormonal problems in white-tailed deer. <coughs> Yeah. So do we see bioaccumulation going on? I don't think it's bioaccumulation like you would in like a DDT situation um, where it kind of accumulates at the top of the food web. At least I haven't seen that yet. But certainly it's getting into the herbivores that are down there. And, um, so, yeah. How do you get your stuff published if no one were reviewing it? So we do get peer-reviewed. Um, so all of our science is peer-reviewed. I'm starting to wonder whether or not we need to reinvent that system too. Uh, it's pretty tiresome. And what I would love to do is just use Ecdysis website and get our science up there. Uh, put it up there, completely transparent, allow people to comment on it and have a dialogue. Right now, the peer review process is not a dialogue. It's not a dialogue. There's a lot of humanity in it. <laughs> Speaking of humanity, yeah. um, from the farmer perspective, I know a lot of the people in here work kind of the choir. Mm -hmm. Do you have any strategies or partners or ideas for how we move beyond these pioneering farmers and, mm -hmm. and hit those early, you know, the mid and late adopters? Right. So, okay. So, yes, um, you're you're absolutely right. This is a, this is one of the huge issues that we're facing right now. Is I think that there's enough momentum on various aspects of this where you don't need the the preacher like John Lundgren or Dwayne Beck to get up there and you know 
kind of you know bitch slap people into attention. Uh, and, and that's going to require a much different approach and a different message. You know who's starting to do it? Our other farmers. And they're sharing their own stories of transition. And that's so much more powerful for middle adopters than, than, than these early adopters. So I think that that's what we're starting to see. Steve Tucker is going to give a talk at our field day this year, uh, as well as Will Harris, who's, if you've never seen 100,000 Beating Hearts, you need to get online and watch that. It's, that guy's like my hero. Um, completely changed his community. And Steve Tucker is, he's pretty new to the game, but man, he's like coming up with whole new distribution systems for grain crops out in uh, western Nebraska that him and his community can start. Yeah, it's a, it's a really positive story. Field days, August 10th. Wasn't one of the points in that Scientific American article that they're having trouble doing the research because their control groups are already contaminated? Yeah, that was a real pain. Yeah, yeah so, uh, yeah, how do you make a control when everything has it? How do, you, how do you get an untreated deer when they get it from the environment at such a rapid rate that it just washes out any, any treatment patterns? Well, we ended up having to look at the relative patterns in the, in, the commu in the population. And then we were able to associate increased mortality as well as uh, organ deficiencies and hormonal deficiencies with that. What about native bees or non honeybees? Yeah, they're getting hosed too. Yep. As bad, if not worse. Well, the accumulation was relatively low on a couple of plants. So is that plant specific then, do you think? Yeah, I think it is. Yep, the different plants are going to have different effects. Um, or, yep, metabolize or take things up differently so as well surface, as surface, plant surface or root. Could or be. What, what do you think? Yeah, it could be all of that, and and maybe physiological too. Yep. Um, so it could. Yep. We don't know all of the mechanisms that might influence it, but certainly, just because you've got a plant out there doesn't mean that plant A is going to have the same amount as plant B. Could it be, I noticed that the corn had more natural predators, and corn came from the Americas, mm. and soybean didn't. Yeah, that's so an interesting that point, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's easy to pray for them or something. Yeah, that could very well be, yeah. Um, yep. And we also, I mean, we, we did a lot more work in corn, too, so maybe that helped us find more species. Have you, have you encountered anywhere in the world where... There's honest science. It, it, fascinating how you uh, broke down that domino effect. Um, you find something, and all of a sudden the wagons are circled, and these different camps. Have, have you found anywhere that's immune? From <coughs> no. 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 The larger an institution gets, the more dependent it gets on big money, and there's only certain certain sources of big money. Isn't that the same thing that Big Pharma does to us? They say we've got a pill for that. Yeah. And Monsanto says we got a jug for that. Oh no, yeah, no. Uh, so Bayer, Bayer makes the products that are that are killing you, and then sells you the aspirin to help you feel better while you're <laughs> right. How about that? How are things going in Europe after the Neonic ban? <clears throat> um, I don't know. I don't know. It's not about banning Neonic. You know, I mean, that's that's something. Oh God, we got to ban glyphosate. Oh God, we got to ban neonics. You know, that's just a symptom. You have to diversify. If there's a perceived need in the farming community for this stuff, then then they're just going to replace one jug with another. There needs to be an education program that teaches them that there's a better way, and that relies on farmers talking to farmers and showing them. You know. What's happening out there? Because they don't—they're not going to listen to a scientist about it. I, I, yeah, that's why I, I had to become a farmer and a beekeeper, just to try to increase our own credibility. One picture you showed up there with your bees—they were all hives, were all in a row, right? Mm. Is that what you normally do? Now in that yard, yeah. That isn't how bees normally live, though. Right, they live uh, 25 feet up in the air mm -hmm. in a in a log that's got 40. Well, honeybees uh, in, a, in a log that's 40 liters, 
Uh, good luck getting honey out of it. So uh, it's you you make sacrifices, don't you, uh, when you're when you when you're producing food. Don't have to. Well, I would argue you do. At least for honey production, if uh, yeah, I don't know how you would raise honey um, in a in a natural environment. I mean, you might want to read the book uh, The Beehive Effect. I still disagree. <laughs> I still disagree. I, and it's not saying that no, hey, I agree that yes, my bees would be happy happier in a in a, if they were out in the wild and doing their thing out there, okay? But you know why they find their the places to live? Pardon? You know why they find places to live? You're looking for something specific, so I'm going to let you go. Okay. What is it? Um, they like higher energy levels coming from the soil. Mm. 250 hertz, we can't live there. We get sick if we lived over that energy level coming out of that soil. Oh. But they, and... Um, Termites and ants all like those high energy levels. Hmm. I'm going to have to think about that. Yeah, no. Um, yep, there's... Thinking outside the box is going to be really important. How to balance that with a domesticated, you know, food production system is, is, is the trick. And... and uh, and that's true for crops, that's true for livestock. How do you balance, you know, a completely natural system with, with, with food production, you know, where we are able to get what we need? There's going to be sacrifices. Um, yeah. Um, earlier, uh, Bill was talking about agroforestry. Mm -hmm. um, so just, and, I, and most of what you talked about was, was grain production and, and um, integrating grain and right, livestock right. production. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious of what you see as potential for integrating perennial um, crop production in with annual crop production. So we're just finishing up a, a, a project out in California. We're hoping to open up a lab out there within the next 18 months or so in almonds, where we found, if you've ever, have you guys ever seen California almond production? Yeah. Sweet Jesus. <laughs> it's like scorched earth policy. I mean, there's nothing living out there. It's, and they're growing these water-intensive crops in a desert at this point. It's disgusting. We found a handful of, of farms that were applying regenerative principles out there. And we compared them with conventional neighbors, just like Claire's study. The, in a, in, I mean, there's water crises out in California right now. In, in the regenerative, they had 10 times the water infiltration rates. They had 30% higher organic matter. They had the same number of insect uh, uh, pests as the neighbors who sprayed their orchards five times. And the regenerative guys didn't have any insecticides used. We're doing profit and nutrient uh, analyses, uh, foodborne pathogens on that system. It's going to be a really, it's going to change California agriculture. It's going to change it. Because out there, it's actually profit motivated. I would argue that corn production in, in the Midwest is probably not profit motivated. <laughs> They'd be growing something different. <laughs> so what is motivating corn production? Oh, uh, socially. I think it's social. Um, and then the subsidies are making it a viable option still. Yeah, the insurance. Chris Nichols called it one of the low-grade industrial matters. Low grade industrial crop? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is there a guideline for the amount of pollinator you need per acre or 80 acres of row crop? Um, uh, what do they say? I mean, beekeepers would tell you. There is no, there is not. Um, so, uh, but beekeepers use the rule of thumb, I think, one hive per two acres or something like that. And you do see a benefit, a yield benefit, even in like soybeans. Um, canola, sunflowers, a lot of these are self-fertilizing. The best way to get a yield bump out of these crops is put a beehive next to them. You can get up to a 20% yield bump out of just having hives, even on these self-fertilizing crops. So... I was talking about acres of pollinator habitat. Oh, okay, not hives per, okay, no. 
We don't know that either. Nope, more as much as you can spare. Why do we have 30 inch rows down every in between corn and soybeans? And that's the width of a horse's butt, right? Well, eventually, originally it was, that's how they plowed it, yeah. 38, 42, 38. 38, oh, okay, okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My goodness, all right. You're talking about a skinny horse. There you go, yeah, so maybe South Dakota horses were a little more. <laughs> Regardless, the point of it is that we are uh, is that we have these behaviors that we have adopted early on, and we haven't. Uh, yeah, too too seldom do we question those things. Fill it up. That was uh, one of our recent experiments um, that we uh, just finished up. We built an interseeder. The farmers in our community get to use it for free. Uh, we just drag a ribbon of seven or eight cover crop species at planting. We plant uh, a cover crop down that row and we find um, the insect predation is doubled. Uh, you don't see insect pests in there anymore. I, we didn't test soil stuff in that study, unfortunately, but the insect community responded within a single year. It was incredible. There was no competition from it. It was like, there's so much terror of integrating interseeds into their fields. If they had seen this, it would, they wouldn't, farmers wouldn't have been so terrified of it. Curious where these names come from. Um, ectysis is sh shedding the old skin. It's metamorphosis. Um, so geeky entomology term, uh, but fitting. And blue dasher is a cool dragonfly species. Um, and so that's kind of the public face of ectysis. People get that. They don't know how to pronounce ectysis. <laughs> what was I thinking? <laughs> Why isn't the whole world entomologist? <laughs> So how big is your, uh, I mean, your farm? You, you, uh, you basically run these tests and things like that? So we, no, so it, it's a demonstration farm. So we're actually, it's an operating farm. So we don't do like component research out there really. We have a research facility that we built. Um, and uh, the farm itself is 53 acres of which uh, half of it is wetlands and unbroken native prairie. Uh, real treasure. And we're holding on to that tooth and nail. Uh, we raise uh, hair sheep for meat production and we use those hair sheep as our primary weed control. So we graze our weeds. I make money off of my weeds. Why would I spend money on weed control when I could, when I could make, make money off of that? That's, that's, that's dumb. Um, pastured pork, uh, we're just starting to get into that. We have an egg production um, where the chickens are an integral part of that. They're completely pastured. Honey production is a big part of it and still make money. And the answer is every single time when you're farming regeneratively. So what, what happened? Tell me about that. Uh, borage was our crop. Um, it was a pain in the butt to harvest. It all shattered, but it, it went through seed production. Um, so I didn't get a crop off of it um, or didn't put much in the bin. Uh, but we made so much honey off of that beforehand um, because borage is one of the top honey producing plants. So. We took honey off before we lost the crop. Beekeeping question. Are you treating your bees? Do you treat your hives at all? You're just no. all natural? No, we don't treat them. Uh, I gave them mineral supplements last year, uh, and I think we're on to something there. I'm going to try some essential oil stuff. Um, but what I'd really like to do is start to provide beekeepers with a plant list that they could provide where the bees could self-medicate. Um, the issue with the bees is that I mean, just like nutrient density in our foods have diminished by about 30 or 40 percent over the last, what, 30 years or so, um, pollen and nectar uh, nutrition has, has gone down by a similar amount um, over the last period of time. And so the bees are finding less forage, and what forage that they're finding is nutritionally insufficient. Is that because of increasing the CO2 and respiration? Could be that, or it could be, you know, um, chelation of, of micronutrients by pesticide use or, or, or other factors, too. Uh, and maybe it's microbial. I think microbes are, uh, the microbial symbioses are going to be really important in, uh, in understanding that. You're saying you don't have role in anything? Uh, we didn't have varroa mite too badly last year. We had good, uh, certain genetic strains that really kept things low. Uh, we lost all of our hives. We've lost all of our hives every year. 
Um, the neighbors smoke them with their pesticides. And, I mean, there's just, yeah, we went in with 75 hives going into winter. Um, two weeks after first frost, they were all dead. I mean, there was hundreds of thousands of bees. Uh, hundreds of pounds of honey on each hive. We were doing everything the way we were supposed to, and um, they couldn't thermoregulate. They, they forgot how to be bees. That's a neonic. Where do you get your bees, Georgia? No, uh, this last year was so we've got so we've got a number of different uh, people that we work with. We're trying to get genetic diversity. We're trying to select for bees that are going to survive within this current matrix. And so it's a hard process, but at the end of it, I'm hoping to get a couple of strains that we can start to disseminate out to beekeepers again. Um, but in the interim, we're killing a lot of bees. Which strains are you working on? A lot. Um, so, uh, yeah, we, we aren't using Russians or anything like that, um, but, but there's some hygienic behavior from Minnesota, there's, and then there's just a number of different genetic strains from all over the country. things up a little bit. We showed your the film you were in, Break from the Herd, oh. uh, to a group that was majority consumers. Mm -hmm. So what would you say would be a great way to keep consumers involved? Do you think it's through films like Break from the Herd, or what do you think? Um, yeah, I think that that's one piece of it. I think uh, how to get consumers involved. Um, I think that there there is growing consumer awareness of, of, of what they're eating. That's helping, um, and fueling that as much as possible is really important. You know what needs to happen is farmers need to start meeting their customers. And that's pretty scary for a lot of farmers. We have a lot of great farmers in this room. Yes, we do. I can see that already. Um, but I think that that's really critical. The relationships are how you're going to change it. At the end of the day, that's what it requires. So there's a lot of farmers in this room, I'd say the majority are farmers in this room, <clears throat> or directly connected. Um, there's quite a few organic farmers with diverse, diversified crop rotations, um, very intensive cover crops on every farm here. Some have livestock, some don't. What are some things that we can do to do better? Um, get livestock. For sure, have that livestock as a component, and not just cows. Um, sheep, uh, pigs, um, and cows integrated together would be a big help. Um, understand that tillage is, is hurt, setting you back. And I know you've got a limited number of tools. Livestock are going to be an, an integral tool for weed management on your farms, plus an added revenue stream. Um, yeah, get, uh, yeah, and many of you guys, especially if you're organic, you're already understanding the importance of flower, floral diversity and plant diversity. You know, there shouldn't be areas of your farm that aren't, that aren't deliberately generating revenue. Maybe it's honey, maybe it's, maybe it's, you know, other aspects of the farm, but think about how to tweak your systems so that you've got diversity and you're making money off of it, yeah. Something about fallow bees before, but um, we've got some farmers in the network who use a green ballot basically, so where they're oh, not I see. part of the same you know, ring pot, but it's on building the soil, soil organic. Yeah, that's different. Yeah, that's not what I was referring to. So yeah, yeah good point. Yeah. Uh, fallow in my part of the country is, you know, bare soil for, you know, a good chunk of the year. Um, and, and that is not doing what as people are saying it's doing. Um, so, yes, ha yep, a green fallow meets those principles, doesn't it? It, it provides living roots on the soil, it, it doesn't leave bare soil, it provides plant diversity, it provides forage for livestock, it does all of these things. That's a really powerful tool. How can you keep raising bees if every year you have to replace them? It's yeah, tell me about bad. it. Yeah. I mean, the cost would be. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, yeah. 
So the industry is collapsing. There's, it's, it's become very much uh, uh, constricted to a few beekeepers who have managed to figure out how to keep their bees alive. Is it as bad out in California or Idaho where they have a lot of seed crops and so a lot of massive bees, amounts of bees out there? So a lot of bees go to California to, to die. Um, and, then they, uh, and then they bring whoever survives and they actually, they can't, they, so the, the migration of the bees was, it would all started up in the Dakotas and in the upper Midwest and then they bring all the bees over down in January or so down to California to pollinate almonds. Some would go up to Washington for, for apples or blueberries and things like this. And then they would all go down to the southeast to rebuild and so they would, uh, they would grow, they'd get a jump on the honey season and stuff like that by bringing them down here and keeping them warm. Then everybody would come back up. So now there's no safe place for the bees anymore. Uh, Nebraska uh, lost almost all of its hives. Almost all of them were dead. Um, and so they can't bring them back to the Midwest anymore. So what they're doing is they're bringing them up into the mountains and into the deserts where there's no agriculture. It's the only safe place for the bees now. What are we experiencing, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So what would the new book, the, the next version of The Beekeeper's Lament sound like? Um, I think that, I think, and I'm already thinking about this, is Silent Spring needs to be rewritten. Um, it was brilliant. It was, it was critical. It was representative of the time. But it made too many concessions said pesticides at some level were okay. And I don't think that that's necessarily the message that we want. It was manipulated, it was, it was corrupted. That message was corrupted. And now I think that we could rewrite that book from a totally different perspective of building systems where this isn't needed anymore. Because we're re-experiencing everything that Rachel Carson saw. Did you ever read the book of Pesticide Conspiracy? I mean, yeah. Never heard of it, did you? Yeah. It was written by a professor at uh, Berkeley. And uh -huh. he spent his uh, career. That's a great book. Have you read it? Uh huh. Yeah, Robert Vandenbosch. Yep. And, uh, he pissed a lot of people off. <laughs> he, he made a lot of people really mad. His life was threatened, etc. You studied out there, didn't you? Yeah, I, mean, I knew him. And uh, he, he used to. Uh, but that book was squelched by the industry. Mm -hmm. You try and go, you can buy it online, but you go to a bookstore, you won't find it. There is major efforts to uh, yep. squelch that book. So yep. Could you repeat the title? Pesticide Conspiracy. Yeah, Pesticide by... Conspiracy by Robert Vandenbosch. It was published in the 80s, early 70s. Was it that long ago? Yeah. <laughs> he started out uh, as a uh, economic entomologist at that time. In you know, spray and count guy, and he, yep. he said he was standing out there, and uh, this plane flew over, and <laughs> he got dusted, yep. and he started to think, he said, you know, I've got the same, my physiology is exactly like these things. He said, what am I doing here? Uh -huh. And he basically switched, and he got into biological control, and he, he was the, uh, oh, the uh, air... Air pilots that spray, they have an association, they hated him, uh, yeah. the missus. I mean, he was really, and then he wrote that book and it made him even matter at it. Yeah. So. That's when Berkeley and, and Davis and, and Riverside, I mean, that's when entomology out there had an impact. Yeah. Yeah. Now they're just totally owned. But you're right, there's lots of pressure to shut it down. Yep. And it isn't anymore, right? I mean, Berk UC Berkeley doesn't have entomology anymore. Davis is like starting well, to... they do, but it's hidden in another department. Exactly. <laughs> they, yep, they, they tucked it away here, there, and everywhere. From your perspective, what's agriculture look like in 25 years? 25 years? Um, I think we will see a complete change. I think that we're going to experience, I mean, you look, okay, read the book, The Worst Hard Times, right? This is about the Dust Bowl. Um, you replace the word wheat in that book with corn, and it's exactly the same thing that we're experiencing right now, and that's what led to the Great Depression, at least partially. Um, so I would say we're, we're on the edge of a cliff right now, staring over it, and, and, and that's going to be real painful to watch, but it's, it's also 
change, or yeah, <laughs> crisis breeds innovation. And we're trying to be ready for when that happens. So, smaller farms, more diversified farms with stacked enterprises, rural communities are starting to rebuild. That's what it's going to look like. Can you talk at all about utilizing perennial pollinating strips, um, intermittent spacings throughout a row crop field? Um, yeah, so we've got, I've got two studies that I would love to give you data on uh, that I haven't analyzed yet, but we've done the work and I just need to get to it. Um, I would recommend, so again, as much, see you later. The, the, more you can, the more you can devote of your land to it, the happier you'll be. The more integrated it is, especially with intercropping or interseeding, Covers in between your crop rows, your annual crop rows. Do it if there's yeah. Figure out a way. Um, and then also, uh, if you've got to use buffer strips of some sort, maybe shoot for one every 300 feet or something like that. We focused a lot on specifically insecticides today. Could you talk a little bit about the effect that herbicide use has? Right. Uh, we just did a risk assessment on, on Roundup. Uh, Roundup, the commercial formulation, WeatherMax is what we tested, was as toxic as the insecticide control to honeybees. Um, yeah, so this was, uh, yeah, the herbicides aren't just, I think the fungicides, the fungicidal seed treatments are probably more toxic than the insecticides are to a lot of uh, non-target insect species. Um, so walk me through that. Yeah. What? What? Uh, so fungicidal seed treatments kill no, microbial. The, the glyphosate. Oh, glyphosate Roundup. So gly glyphosate molecule itself seems to have low toxicity to honeybees. The adjuvants and the stickers and the defoamers and stuff like that. The NMP. You should stay awake at night worrying about. <laughs> um, because that stuff is, is it's disrupting cellular membranes on a, on a rapid level. How glyphosate molecule is affecting um, most non-target organisms is by dis disrupting their microbial communities. Um, our symbionts, we are not, yeah. You have more bacteria in your body than you have human cells. You are a walking sack of bacteria. Um, it influences your behavior, it influences when you sleep, when you're awake, what you're hungry for, who you're in love with. <laughs> this is, uh, I mean, so these things are, and so um, um, glyphosate is, a, is an antimicrobial. And I think that that's having a bigger effect than we realize. How do you assess the risk of that? You know how difficult that is? You know how difficult risk assessment is? I mean, the, the mortality is the easy thing to measure. We cannot see how these pesticides are affecting us. And that doesn't mean we should ban everything. It means we should respect them a lot more than we do. So, with this new fungus that is worldwide now, the Canada aurus, mm, I don't know this. Well, it's, it's um, pretty resistant to... Everything. Yes, and they, some scientist in the Netherlands has connected it back to using anti, uh, fungicides. Is that right? Mm -hmm. There you go. It's antibiotic overuse. Right. Yeah, the foodborne pathogens are because, uh, the only reason we're seeing these things in our agricultural, you know, our horticultural crops is because we've killed the soil. I mean, there's no biotic resistance to these, <laughs> these pathogens that you can just take over. So last year, in the past couple of years, we've seen um, and heard reports of um, beekeepers and, and farmers um, having low honey production and blaming it or thinking that the volatile herbicides that are out there yeah, are dicamba. Yeah, dicamba 2,4-D being used in early spring and throughout the summer, reducing nectar mm -hmm. and pollen availability. Yeah. So I guess my question is, I think know, there's direct effects here too. we have this this huge problem with the neonics being out there asking people to diversify their farms and then we have these volatile herbicides that are moving we don't know where and how and when. So how do we protect biodiversity 
when you know we have all these great actors, these great farmers in the ground, but this movement, I don't feel personally, is going fast enough no, it's to not. address these issues. So how do we take steps to to address it with some urgency? Um, so it, it's probably too late. What we're experiencing right now is a major evolutionary event. We are selecting for species that can survive within a pesticide-laden landscape. Um, That's not what I wanted to hear from you. <laughs> I, uh, uh, it, but change has to start somewhere, right? And you guys are the, the instruments of change. And so make sure that you are changing the way that you're farming, right? And not do it quietly, you know? Become a member of your community and, 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 and talk to people, even if it's one neighbor at a time. Drag them to a meeting like this, you know? They're curious in what you're doing. They're terrified of what you're doing, but they're curious, I'll bet. One of the ways to appreciate diversity is to eat the weeds. Yeah. Shepherd's purse and purseline are superfoods. Yeah, they're great. Damn tasty. Love it, yeah. <laughs> Nobody yeah. eats them. Yep, change your perspective, right? View problems as opportunities. My weeds are forage. So, sheep love them. <laughs> yep. What kind of honey harvest did you get off that barrage? Uh, we were building a lot of wax at the time, so I don't know the exact amount, but I think I estimated about... Um, we were getting like two to three hundred pounds an acre of honey or something like that. And so at eight dollars a pound, that's a pretty good return. A lot of that went to that wax production. We're in year three of the farm and it's finally starting to gel. Everything is starting to gel. We had a lot of irons in the fire all at once, trying to develop a research lab and research program and get the farm off the ground. And was a lot. Did you say it's only year three? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You talked about the regenerative corn system, but you didn't tell us what it was. Well, it depended on the different farmers. Um, all of them were using cover crops. That was a big part of it. Um, all of them were, you know, except for the organic guys, they were no-tillers. Um, there was three organic farmers in there, um, but the majority of them were conventional. Uh, they were marketing their products differently. So the reasons for the uh, the reasons for the the profit differential in the between the two treatments was that the regenerative folks spent a lot less on fertilizers. Most of them spent nothing at all. Um, they they also spent a lot less on seed. Probably about 150 to 200 dollars a bag less because they were getting conventional varieties. And then they were marketing their products, not just selling it to the coop. And that value added was influential to their bottom line. They also were taking grazing off of that system and things like that, so if they were integrating livestock in there. Um, so it was a big, big region, and different farmers did it differently. And that's one of the noisy things about doing systems level science and, and, and why we struggle sometimes to publish on it but I think it's also the most relevant of science. How do we work with researchers, because you, you kind of hit on it, to do, to get promoted or to get publicity, you gotta have something cool. Right. How can we show something cool with the redundancy where we can run 4,000 studies and they all come up with the same result? Right. That's kind of cool. It's pretty cool. <laughs> um, Right, so your farms are, are, is that what you're saying? Is that that's the 4,000 farms or something? Or what, well, you know, just, that just it works. <clears throat> how do you get science? How do you get scientists to do redundant studies? Uh, you know how much that costs? Oh, thank you. Pony up. Uh, the days of, you get what you pay for, right? And so if you're not paying for information, I think farmers have become a little bit spoiled with, with, um, and and yes, there are good extension agents out there who are doing good things. There's also a lot of extension agents who are simply trying to maintain the current uh, the current system, and and 
make as many people happy with a single bite of information as they can. And um, if farmers want education, they need to pay for it. I'd agree with that. But, uh, I don't know if any of y'all have attended a soil health academy or not, mm. but it's you know $1,200. If you can't recoup that cost from right. the first year of going to it, you're doing something wrong. Yep. And you'll, you'll network with a community that is across this world. Yes. Yeah. That's great. That's a yep. That's a good piece of advice right there. Paying two or three hundred dollars for a meeting registration, where I mean, if you're going there, you know, with you know, laying back and not thinking you're actually going to, how to use the information you're getting, then yeah, you may as well just put the money in the toilet and flush it down. But if you go there listening for tidbits of information, I mean, tonight, you know what? You want a you want a five to twenty bushel yield bump. In your soybeans, how much does that pay? If you can reduce uh, by getting a honey beehive next to it, come on. Uh, if you wanted to save $10 to $15 per acre, I had a farmer come up to me after his talk, or after one of my talks, he was down in Kansas, and he's like, I, I was listening to you and I abandoned all my seed treatments this last year. And, and I'm like, oh, how'd that go? And, and he's like, well, the aren't... <laughs> The army worms were pretty bad at first, but and I'm like, oh yeah, and, and he's like, yep, but the beans look real good. You saved me $10,000 last year. $10,000. Man, if we could get 10% of that and put it back into R&D, think of the people we could help. Yeah, people saving their own seed. Yeah. Yeah, not not a lot. Those were the days, though, weren't they? <laughs> well, the, if the bees are visiting the soybeans, they're not, and the seeds are treated. Uh, there's no, no pickup uh, in the. Uh, no, they're getting it from the beans too. Yeah, but I mean, they're getting it from, they're getting it from everywhere, dude. It's just incredible. So it would be, in the theory, uh, at that one part per billion level. At very low levels, I think, yeah. Very low levels. But, I mean, that's the kind of low levels that's so sublethal effects that are really hosing them. Yeah, Kim? Um, so I've, I've had many people in the past couple of years mention that they feel like there's this plant transpiration issue of chemicals. Mm. How real do you think that the possibility is of that really happening. Very real. Very real. Yep. Very real. Could you, um, so uh, is our pesticides getting into leaf va or vapor from the plants as they transpire? And are they being kind of carried around? So well, the idea they're water soluble. Yeah, right? That's right. So we'd be breathing all that. Yeah. Yeah. I thought you said you were going to end up getting. <laughs> <laughs> you guys were asking the questions. <laughs> you were asking those questions. I got to go. I was trapped. Before it gets worse. Well, good note. Good note. Um, uh, I can give one story, and I'm not quite sure what exactly caused this. Uh, it was about 10 years after my uh, family farm had been through transition and certified organic. Um, Dad was always on a long crop rotation. He, he's always had cattle on it. Um, and then he had a wheat field that crossed the road to the south. The neighbor had a conventional wheat field. And then south of that is a river. Um, there was a flush of army worms that came in and they ravaged the conventional wheat field, and then they sprayed them while well, they were still going. They got through the road ditch, crossed the road, into the road ditch, and 15 feet into the organic field, they just stopped. Hmm. Yeah. That was it? That was it. <laughs> really? You saw that on your farm, too? Somebody eat them, or what? I mean, they attacked or no, they anything. just, just put pupated. Oh, okay. They were full. Hmm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
what I think is a positive note. I'm not a farmer, I'm a beekeeper, but I look around the room, I see a lot of farmers, I see a lot of young farmers, kind of like, okay, there's something else out there. Yeah. So to me, there, that shows a little more hope. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that is. I think, so you're, I think you're right, yep. Uh, I think that the, the future of farming is going to be folks that are trying to figure out how to farm 100 acres or less and make a living off of it. I mean, with land prices being what they're at right now, and and, uh, and so, yeah, stacking enterprise, regenerative ag works real well in that situation. Is there a directory of beekeepers that are looking for more land? Um, usually you can call your state apiarist. I don't know if Illinois has one or not. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> they have an inspector anyway. Yeah. 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 Uh, so yeah. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for listening.